Engineers at Citroen are renowned for their innovative design and expertise. They are constantly seeking to break new ground, setting themselves new challenges and evolving and developing the model range. Supported by state-of-the-art research and development facilities, the team of world-class engineers ensure Citroen continue as leaders in the application of motor vehicle technology. This program for technicians is the fourth video in a series and covers two separate developments of the basic hydropneumatic suspension system, namely the hydractive system and the active roll control system, also known as ARCS. If you haven't already viewed the previous three tapes, then we advise that you do so before watching this one. The program is in four sections. Section 1 provides a brief recap of the basic hydropneumatic system. Section 2 explains how the basic system has evolved to become the hydractive system and explains how it works. Section 3 is all about the active roll control system. While Section 4 looks at some of the practical aspects of both systems. There is an accompanying workbook which, like before, contains some questions for you to answer. We recommend that you watch the video at least twice before attempting the questions. Successful completion of the workbook will be recorded upon your annual training certificate. Let's begin by reminding ourselves of the source and reserve of pressure circuit. As you know, LHM stored in the reservoir is supplied to the 6 plus 2 pump. The two-piston part of the pump provides fluid to the main accumulator and pressure regulator. Excess fluid is directed back to the reservoir via a return line. From the regulator, pressurized fluid passes to the safety valve. At the safety valve, fluid is directed to the front brake circuit or additionally, at pressures above 80 bar, to the suspension and rear brake circuit. The suspension system comprises height correctors, suspension cylinders and spheres, return lines and the two anti-sinking valves. Note that on hydractive vehicles, the valves perform exactly the same function. However, their hydraulic connections differ to those of the basic system. In the Citroen Xantia and the Citroen XM, the conventional road spring and shock absorber are replaced by a hydropneumatic sphere. And as you know, an integral damper slows down the movement of fluid between the sphere and cylinder. The size of the damper hole and the bump and rebound characteristics vary depending upon the model. The hydractive system is an evolution of the basic hydropneumatic system. It provides two different suspension systems for one vehicle, thanks to the application of electronics. Hydractive suspension switches automatically between a soft, comfortable ride and a firm suspension in response to the customer's driving style or the prevailing road conditions. Switching is achieved within four one hundredths of a second and provides three changes of state to the suspension characteristics. It changes spring rate, damping, and roll resistance. When the Citroen XM was launched, it was the first car ever to be fitted with hydractive suspension. As a luxury saloon, it was appropriate that it benefited from the intelligence of electronic sensing with the flexibility of hydraulic control. 
By 1993, the second generation of Hydractive appeared, known as Hydractive II. It's the Hydractive II system which we'll be looking at in this program, and is currently fitted to certain Citroën Xantia and Citroën XM models. When operating in the soft setting, the system incorporates two additional suspension spheres. There's one for the front suspension and another for the rear. Each sphere is screwed onto a unit known as a stiffness regulator. And within each regulator is an electro valve. We'll see how the stiffness regulator and electro valve work together later. But for now, let's see how the additional spheres affect the spring rate, damping and roll resistance. There's a sphere for each of the suspension cylinders. As you know, nitrogen gas within the sphere provides the elastic or spring component for the suspension. To alter the spring rate, the volume of gas has to be varied. For a softly sprung suspension, the additional sphere is included in the circuit. Whereas for a firm suspension, the additional sphere is isolated by an electro valve de-energizing. Variable damping is achieved by a similar method. There's the familiar damper unit in each of the suspension spheres, and at either side of the additional sphere there are two more. When in soft, minimal damping is achieved because the LHM can flow through all four dampers. For firm damping, fluid is prevented from flowing through the additional dampers and into the additional sphere. Hence the fluid can now only flow through one damper on each side of the car, and the damping is increased. Having explained how the hydractive system changes the spring rate and the damping, let's now consider the other aspect of the suspension that can be altered, the roll resistance. Remember, on the basic hydropneumatic system, the two suspension cylinders on each axle are linked. When cornering, the body rolls and fluid may pass from the compressed cylinder to the extended cylinder. Note that under these conditions the volume and pressure of the nitrogen gas is unaffected. Therefore, roll resistance on the hydropneumatic vehicles is essentially provided by the anti-roll bars alone. In contrast, hydractive vehicles have an additional roll resistance strategy which enhances comfort and safety. When in soft and negotiating a gentle bend, the LHM passes between the suspension cylinders, but the flow is limited by two restrictors. In the firm setting, an electro valve isolates the two suspension units from each other to provide the maximum resistance to roll. In this situation, the flow of LHM is obstructed, and the suspension spheres in conjunction with the anti-roll bars, resist body roll. The hydractive control unit, located here, automatically switches the suspension between soft and firm. The decision when to switch is made dependent upon inputs received from various sensors relating to the driving style. There are five main input sensors. The steering wheel sensor, vehicle speed sensor, accelerator pedal travel sensor, brake pressure sensor, body movement sensor. And a sixth input is the driver-operated sport mode switch. 
we'll now consider each sensor in a little more detail. The steering wheel sensor, located as you'd probably expect behind the steering wheel, generates three important signals. It enables the control unit to determine the direction and angle through which the steering wheel is turned. And it also informs the control unit on how quickly the wheel is turned. The sensor comprises two light emitters and two receivers. And between them is a specially cut disc fixed to the steering column. The light beams either pass through the disc or are interrupted by it, resulting in a signal which is interpreted by the control unit. Vehicle speed information is supplied to the control unit from a Hall effect sensor mounted on the gearbox. It's arguably the most important as it's used in conjunction with the other sensors to help inform the control unit of the driver's style of driving. The accelerator pedal travel sensor measures the pedal movement. It informs the control unit on the pedal's position and how quickly it moves during both acceleration and deceleration. The brake pressure sensor is located on the left-hand side of the front subframe. It's simply a switch which removes an earth signal to the ECU when there's sufficient pressure in the brake circuit. As soon as the brake pressure falls, the switch closes again. This sensor has been deleted from Citroen Xantia DAM7901 onwards, which now detect deceleration using the vehicle speed sensor. The body movement sensor operates in a similar fashion to the steering wheel sensor. It's connected to the front anti-roll bar by a linkage, which rotates a toothed ring between two optical units. The signal generated informs the control unit of the anti-roll bar's direction of rotation and its amount and rate of movement during bump and rebound. The control unit continually processes all the input signals with regard to threshold values within its memory and, if appropriate, alters the suspension setting. For example, acceleration is likely to encourage the control unit to switch to firm. The final main input signal to the control unit is from the sport mode switch. It allows the driver to select a revised suspension strategy. Once selected, the switch is illuminated, and the control unit now compares all the input signals to a lower set of threshold values within its memory. The result is that the suspension switches from soft to firm sooner than if normal mode had been selected. Having processed all the input information, the control unit generates output signals for the electro valves within the front and rear stiffness regulators. This alters the suspension characteristics between soft and firm by changing the spring rate, damping and roll resistance mentioned earlier. Whenever the electro valves are energized, the suspension will be soft. Conversely, when the electro valves are de-energized, the suspension switches to firm. Additionally, output signals are sent to the warning light within the sport switch and, of course, to the diagnostic socket. A refinement is the inclusion of the anti-jolt facility, which provides two additional input signals to the control unit. These indicate if a door or the luggage compartment is opened by sending an earth signal to the control unit.
Without this facility, if the ignition is switched off, the electro valves are de-energized and the suspension adopts the firm setting. If in this condition the pressure in the main suspension spheres alters, by a load being added for example, then a pressure difference will occur between the additional spheres and the suspension spheres. If the ignition is subsequently switched on, the valves would re-energize and the additional spheres would be reconnected to the hydraulic circuit. This could result in a sudden change to the ride height, causing the vehicle to jolt up or down. This possibility is prevented by the anti-jolt system, which is an integral part of the control unit. When getting into or out of the car, a door or tailgate switch is triggered and the ECU is switched on for a short period. Hence the pressures in the spheres equalize and prevent jolting when the ignition is turned on. The Active Roll Control System, ARCS, designed to optimize the dynamic handling of the vehicle, is only available on Citroën Xantia Activa vehicles fitted with the Hydractive system. It's not fitted to the Citroën XM. Available since 1995, the system was, and still remains, technically years ahead of any of our competitors. Vehicles fitted with arcs react within a fraction of a second to limit the body roll to less than one degree. This intervention occurs each time the vehicle is liable to roll, thereby enhancing driving comfort. Safety is improved too because the tyres remain squarely in contact with the road, ensuring optimum steering and braking performance. By the way, Citroën's technical information refers to the active roll control system as SC stroke car. Before explaining the system, let's begin by looking at what we mean by the term body roll. Any vehicle can be rotated around each of three axes. If a vehicle rotates about this axis, it will lean, and this is known as roll. Lateral forces cause the vehicle to roll and are usually created by cornering, side wind, or when one wheel passes over a bump. Driving on a banked road will also cause the car to lean. The angle at which the vehicle leans will depend upon the intensity of the force, the position of the center of gravity and the point of thrust, and the ability to resist the lateral force, in other words, the flexibility of the suspension. As we saw earlier, the hydractive system combats roll in its soft state by damping the flow of LHM between the two suspension cylinders. In its firm setting, the two cylinders are isolated to produce the maximum anti-roll resistance. The active roll control system can operate whilst the hydractive suspension setting is soft and so arcs can be considered as separate to the hydractive system. Arcs has two additional strategies to combat roll. Firstly, it alters the stiffness of the anti-roll bars, and secondly, it can load the anti-roll bars to oppose the body roll. Before looking at how the anti-roll bars are stiffened, let's consider the extra components of the arcs system. Firstly, there's the two roll correction actuators, one for the front axle and the other for the rear. These jack up or pull down on the suspension to combat roll, acting like a variable length anti-roll bar drop link. Fitted to the front subframe is the roll corrector. It's similar in design and operation to a height corrector 
although it reacts more quickly, detecting front suspension movement via its linkages and control plate. The ARC system also includes a separate accumulator sphere. The final component, mounted on the rear subframe, is the roll stiffness regulator, also known as the ARCS regulator. Complete with its own electrovalve and sphere, it's controlled by the ECU. So let's now look in more detail at how the stiffness of the anti-roll bars is altered and then see how the roll control actuators operate. LHM from the safety valve enters the electrovalve of the roll stiffness regulator. The fluid can also flow to each of the actuators, the other side of which are connected to the regulator. To ensure that the vehicle is balanced during roll correction, the actuators are fitted diagonally opposite to each other. The front actuator is on the left-hand side of the car, whilst the rear one is located on the right-hand side. With no current flow, the electrovalve remains closed. Under this condition, the regulator's slide valve is subjected to pressure on its upper face from the sphere, whilst its other end is connected to the reservoir. In this condition, the regulator is at rest. The two actuators are thus connected to each other and to the sphere, resulting in the stiffness state of the anti-roll bar being soft. As the vehicle enters a bend, the control unit, in less than four hundredths of a second, energizes the electrovalve and closes the return line to the reservoir. The regulator's slide valve then moves, due to the action of the high-pressure LHM fluid coming from the safety valve. When this occurs, the actuators remain connected to each other, but are isolated from the sphere. This action puts the anti-roll bars into their firm state, which approximately doubles their stiffness. For short bends, or whilst taking avoiding action, this is the only response triggered by the control unit. However, when negotiating a longer bend that lasts for several tenths of a second, and the tilt of the passenger compartment exceeds half a degree, the roll correction actuators move to level the car. This is achieved via the roll corrector in the front hydraulic circuit and by the separate accumulator which accommodates any slight fluctuations in fluid flow. Let's see how the actuators operate to combat body roll. The roll corrector's valve only moves when the lateral forces are large enough to cause roll. It has three hydraulic connections, a supply from the high pressure circuit, a return line to the reservoir, and a connection to the actuators. In its neutral position, no fluid flows through the valve. When the vehicle turns to the left, the roll corrector's valve also moves to the left. To aid explanation, we've drawn the roll corrector at its point of maximum travel. This allows LHM to flow to both actuators, and because of their piston's surface areas, they extend and load the suspension to correct the roll. If the cornering force is not so great, less roll occurs and the roll corrector valve doesn't move to its maximum. In turn, the proportion of fluid passing through the valve is reduced and the pressure difference on either side of the actuator's pistons is less. Consequently, the actuators don't move as far, and there's less roll correction than before. When turning sharply to the right, the opposite occurs. The roll corrector moves to its maximum right position, allowing fluid from the actuators to flow back to the reservoir. As a result, the actuators contract, which limits the body roll to the left. The control unit analyzes the steering wheel position and the vehicle's speed 
in order to detect the end of the bend, whereupon the roll corrector is re-centralized due to the action of its linkages and the system returns to its initial point of equilibrium. In this section, we'll see how to adjust the roll corrector, discuss the programming of control units, and see how to depressurize the system. We'll start with adjusting the roll corrector. This should be carried out if the car is leaning to one side. Begin by driving the car onto a four-post ramp and check that the tyre pressures are correct. Ensure that the height control lever is set to the normal position. Leave the engine running and double-check that the parking brake is fully off. Next, loosen both height corrector collars and disconnect the manual height control lever. And ensure that the front and rear ride heights are approximately correct. If necessary, use the special tool to adjust the heights. You'll accurately set the heights at the end of the procedure. However, for now, leave the collars loose. This prevents the height correctors from operating while you're adjusting the roll corrector. Now measure the height, H1, at the left and right of the front subframe. A difference between the two measurements of up to 5 mm is permissible. If the difference is greater, then the roll corrector's link rods will need adjusting. Before carrying out any adjustments, slacken the bolts connecting the linkage to each lower arm, and then re-tighten them to the torque figure specified in the repair information. This ensures that there is no unwanted free play. To ease adjustment, it's advisable to clean the threads either side of the adjusting sleeves. Next, loosen the lock nuts, remembering that each sleeve has one nut which has a left-hand thread. and then set the distance between the threaded extremities of both rods to the figure L found in the workshop manual. At this stage you're now ready to make the adjustments. Simultaneously gently turn both adjusting sleeves in the same direction until the car appears to be level. Check that the balance lever's springs at either end are contacting the ends of their slots and that the levers are centered. Remeasure the heights H1 and if they're within specification, tighten the adjustment sleeve lock nuts ensuring that there's a 6 mm gap between the link rod and the anti-roll bar bearing. This ensures that the rods don't contact the bearing, which may impair their operation.
Next, operate the roll corrector by hand in both directions and then let the car settle. At this point, recheck that the car is level. Finally, reset the front and rear ride heights, which was covered in video 2. There are two types of control unit. One for hydractive systems without arcs, and a second for vehicles fitted with arcs. The colours of the two 15-pin connectors identify them. Hydractive control units have one black and one white connector, whereas the AUX control unit has a green and a white connector. Replacement control units require programming to match the vehicle. This ensures the correct parameters stored within the ECU's memory are utilised for that particular car. Programming the control unit is carried out using Lexia or Proxia, and by following the instructions in the workshop manual. If using Lexia, then programming is carried out under the Replacement Parts menu. And if you're using Proxia, you'll need to be under the Configuration menu. Note, the procedure can only be carried out once. If you make a mistake, it's likely that you'll need to order another ECU. If problems are encountered whilst programming, the control unit automatically defaults to the parameters for a Citroën Xantia. Safety is of the utmost importance, so if you need to depressurize the system, ensure you follow the correct procedure. Depressurizing the hydractive system of a car in running order is the same as for depressurizing a hydropneumatic vehicle fitted with anti-sinking valves. However, for vehicles fitted with arcs, then the following procedure should be followed, in conjunction with the instructions in the workshop manual. The first part of the procedure should be familiar. Set the suspension into low. Run the engine for at least 60 seconds and let the car sink. This returns most of the LHM from the suspension spheres the hydractive spheres and the rear brake accumulator to the reservoir. Next, switch off the ignition and slacken the 12 mm nut on the main pressure regulator by one turn. Attach a pipe to the bleed screw of the arc's roll stiffness regulator. Put the other end of the pipe into a suitable container and slowly open the bleed screw. Finally, operate the link rods to the roll corrector four or five times in each direction to depressurize both of the arc spheres, thus making the system safe. Don't forget to tighten the bleed screws and check for any leaks after completing your work. If, for whatever reason, the engine cannot be run, then the system can be depressurized using the special tool 4135T and by carefully following the instructions in the workshop manual. That concludes this program on the hydractive and arcs systems. We hope you found the information in this video and the previous three tapes in the series helpful and that it will assist you to work upon the system safely and effectively. Please now stop the tape and answer the questions in the workbook.